Welcome back to a live version of Kings of the North College Football Playoff just announced, Landis. And do we want to start by talking about the absolute SEC massaging by ESPN? Dog mentality! College football lawyer Stetson Bennett was obviously hired by Georgia to make sure they were part of the announcement, or should we actually talk about the playoff? I think we should talk about the playoff. Okay, we should talk right. about the top two seeds being okay. our teams. And then we will get around to uh, trashing the SEC and every one of them. Oh, my goodness. So two northern teams at the top of the rankings. Michigan's the one seed will face number four, Alabama, in the Rose Bowl. Washington is the two seed will face number three, Texas, in the Sugar Bowl, both on January 1st. The Rose Bowl is the first game at 5 Eastern. The Sugar Bowl, the second game at 845 Eastern. Uh, the first time ever that a northern team is the number one seed, much less having the northern teams take the top two spots. Bill, were you surprised that undefeated Florida State was left out? Or did you expect this is how it would go down because of dog mentality and the SEC being the SEC? Uh, I, you know what? I, I actually was surprised. Um, you know, not not totally surprised. Right? I thought this was on the table. Uh, certainly, my preference would have been different. We can we can talk about that. But uh, I I thought that there was a better than fifty percent chance of it, that that Florida State would end up getting that spot. I I thought they had. A sound argument for it. Like I understand, I I understand the rationale. I suppose I, I don't agree with it, but I, I understand how they arrived at the point. Um, but it is it's crazy to me to see a, a thirteen and zero Power Five conference champ not not in this field. And I, and I thought in the end they would lean toward that more than they would toward uh, the dog mentality uh, of the SEC. But uh, here we are. Uh, we see Seth in the YouTube comments saying Florida State might be in the South, but they're brothers tonight. SEC right. stepping on them. It is interesting because like we've divided college football North and South, which the sport has really divided itself North and South. But Florida State's not as South as Bama and Texas after winning the Big 12 title game. Well, they were chanting SEC. They have thrown in their lot. So Florida State, now Florida State probably wants to maybe be in the SEC or they might want to be in the Big Ten, but they have not thrown in their lot to the same degree. So I do think we can count Florida State as an honor. They were in the alliance. We can count yeah. Florida State as an honorary member of the North today while they are getting absolutely shafted. Mostly by circumstance. I don't think the committee shivved them, the structure of the sport shivved them. But it is difficult because if Jordan Travis was healthy, there's no doubt Florida State would be in, right? They're out because their starting quarterback is, is out. Yeah, yes, the 100% yes. But I don't, like if if the game on Saturday played out the same way, but Tate Rodemaker played, the, were they in or no? Like I know they were on their third quarterback. Was, was Jordan Travis not being there and not being available for the playoff well, merely enough no matter because how? Because Tate Rodemaker is going to be back. It's right. he's he has a concussion, right? I mean, he's yes. not out for the season. No. So if they got dinged because they had to play their third string quarterback, well, their second string quarterback is going to return. So here's what I actually I think this is a problem in college football. And it's not only north and south because be, there's been a time the SEC used to play great defense. Right. LSU and Alabama played a national championship game that was what? Seven to four. What was that national championship? Game? The one that everybody hated. I right? fell asleep. I can't remember. Yeah. So like when yeah. the SEC does it, like great defense is like dog mentality. Defense wins championships. Dog mentality. Yesterday, Texas slices and dices an incompetent Oklahoma State defense, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a great Texas win. Florida State shuts down what has been a good, maybe very good Louisville offense. And that's an ugly game, right? Michigan, Iowa is a defensive game. That's an ugly game. We still in college football have a hard time realizing that defense can be as dominating as offense and that a high scoring game isn't good or awesome or dominating and a low scoring game isn't necessarily bad or sloppy or unimpressive. But I felt like that was part of the discourse. Texas made a statement. Why didn't Florida State make a statement Right. With Jared Verse and a bunch of other really good defensive players by going out there and making Louisville look like a third of what it looked like offensively the entire year. Didn't you feel that vibe? 
Yeah, I did. I mean, the, the the path to victory for Florida State in that game was to somehow make Louisville look like it was the team playing with its third string quarterback. Yeah, and that's exactly what Florida State did. Like, I, I don't yeah. understand why they don't get credit for that. Like that that was an incredible defensive performance. Like, I, I get it wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing game. You know, like neither was the Big Ten championship, and and for stretches neither was the SEC championship. So, I it, it's just. I, I don't know. It's hard when you shoot, when you hamstring yourself, I guess, with only four spots and you end up with more than four um, deserving teams, I, I suppose. But the, I th- I thought the defensive performance from Florida State was going to be enough for them to overcome what was certainly uh, you know, a, a lackluster offense performance and, and a perception of them that they are a lesser team without Jordan Travis. That's all true. But you know, teams have offenses and defense. I don't know why we're holding Florida State's offense against it. Yeah, so I don't know. Do we want to get to my um, – I could reveal my – the SEC can suck it version of how events hmm. could have transpired. Yeah. Would we, is it too early for the SEC can suck it version that I may have presented to the committee had I been in the room? No, I think, are, I think are, now's are the right interested? time. Are we interested yeah. in that? By the way, history of the playoff, uh, Power 5 conference champs to get in. The SEC is now 10 for 10. Their conference champ made it every year. By the way, like conference champs get left out all the time. It's five into four. The math doesn't work. The SEC, 10 for 10. The ACC and the Big 10, seven out of 10 years. The Big 12, six out of 10. And this is only the third time that the Pac-12 champ has made the four-team playoff in the 10-year era. The other spots then, twice an SEC non-champ made it, twice a Big 10 non-champ made it, Notre Dame made it twice, and Cincinnati made it as a group of five team once. So the SEC got through without making it. Okay, here is the whitewashing of the SEC's role in the destruction of college football as we know it that could have come back around and bitten them in their southern patootie today if the committee had so chosen if the SEC had not hired Stetson Bennett, college football lawyer. How dare! Uh, I think I would like to make a presentation to the committee. Uh, Stetson, we we don't really allow outside counsel in the room. (laughs) I have two national championship rings that gives me grounds in summer of 2021. The the group studying it suggests a 12 team playoff, June 2021. All right. And I'm saying this because the SEC came out with the we could have had a 12 team playoff right now this season if it wasn't for the alliance. And as everybody remembers, the alliance was the union of the ACC, the Pac-12, and the Big Ten that was formed as a scheduling thing, but also sort of like formed as a wall against the SEC and ESPN Mm -hmm. because it felt like the SEC and ESPN were going to take over college football. June of 2021, they say, let's do a 12-team playoff. July of 2021, the SEC steals Texas and Oklahoma from the Big 12. And everybody says, okay, let's chill out. So they form the alliance like a couple weeks after the SEC move. And I liked the alliance at the time because you're just, you are stalling. You're stalling on purpose. It's not an accidental stall. Now Greg Sankey is talking to Ross Dellinger at Yahoo and making it like, well, the SEC, like the, the, the alliance, excuse me, the alliance slowed us down or we could be at 12 right now. It was that move, it was the shiving of the Big 12 by Greg Sankey and the SEC that caused everybody to say, hey, they're trying to take over the sport. Let's chill out, right? Wasn't that why the Mm -hmm. alliance was formed and why all of a sudden what had been more of a fast track for a 12-team playoff that would have gotten us there by this season was all of a sudden slow played because everybody wanted to make sure it wasn't going to become the SEC takes over the world. Yeah, that's exactly how it happened. Yeah, it did. It did because we were. It felt like we were like on the like right on the doorstep, right, of this happening this year, and then it was it was it was a quick quick pull up, hit the brakes when that happened. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just like in June twenty one, they say let's do it. They wind up announcing that they're going to a twelve team playoff on December first, twenty twenty two. So like exactly a year ago, and they're like, we can't get it together for twenty twenty three. It's too fast. We can't get it together. So that's why it's delayed. So here's my point. The SEC and Greg Sankey are now trying to blame the alliance for why it didn't happen faster. Why did it really not happen faster? Because of the SEC and Texas. So you know what I think would have been fair? Why do I have balloons? Did you see balloons come in my screen? Oh, you have. Yeah, there's like a thing that's turned on. Um, 
I'll have to turn it off after the fact, but certain hand gestures uh, can, oh. can elicit certain... That happened to Austin and I. We were doing an episode of Snap Judgments. Austin gave a thumbs up, and then, like, fireworks went off. <laughs> so, I thought depending. somebody... I thought somebody was like, oh, I'm giving Doug his balloons for this attack on Grace. Yeah, this no, is so it's good. A, I don't know why it's a default with, with Apple computers, but it is. We'll turn it off <laughs> after the fact. If you're listening on your podcast, balloons. Also, it's uh, I actually have had minor complications from an eye surgery I had a year ago. And I was like, am I seeing balloons in my eye that aren't there? <laughs> Do I have to call the eye doctor again? <laughs> no, we're just ce- um, we're celebrating the North having the top two seats. That's all it is. <laughs> okay, so... So who's at fault? Why are we not at 12 right now? Two entities, honestly, the SEC and Texas. So I think it would have been fair to say you did this. Pick between yourselves like you. You're not getting both in. It's your fault. You're the instigators. So we're taking the three undefeated champs. And then you're the ones who screwed this up. Mm. Let's flip a coin on you guys. That an eye in the room. And also, if you're going to chant sec yeah at right. the big 12 title game <laughs> then you are taking the sec champ and the sec champ this year is texas because texas beat alabama and alabama beat georgia and texas won the sec so fine oh the sec got left out no it didn't you chanted it texas yeah. is in Bama's out i think i would have in a world where i think the actual football is impossible to parse and obviously i mean florida state gets left out because of an injury i would have pushed forth the idea of leaving a team out because they were (laughs) (laughs) a-holes you want to do it yeah like uh what was oh in the in the in the dark night when the joker is uh he's in the room with the guys and he says we're going to have uh expansion we're going to have tryouts and he breaks the pool cue and he throws in between them and says go ahead and fight over it that's what you want yeah. to do with texas and alabama i like i love yeah. it yeah we should make we should make them play you want to make them play well that my wife was like well, why can't you just do that like all of this is made up if you would have said eight days bama you call bama in texas and say we can either pick between you or you can play each other in eight days your choice what do you want to do right yeah i mean like who who's stopping them Nobody's in charge of anything. Who's stopping them? And it only would have been, it only would have gotten a, a 50 share. I mean, like would have been, and you can keep the money. What would I like? Keep the tickets, keep the revenue, keep the extra TV. Re- like you just, but then there's no decision. But I do think like the sport, this is all this is. And, and you know, a lot, I guess, Boo Car- Corrigan's on TV, but he's being interviewed by uh, SCCSPN. So we don't, we'll, we'll do our show here. Um, <laughs> Like I, I, there's no rules about anything. So kind of like make it up as you go along because like five into four was always going to be a problem. And that's, what's coming home to roost here. And it is ironic that it comes home to roost in the last time that it's a problem because it's getting solved two ways next year. Cause we're only going to have four power five conferences and we're going to 12. So, um, I do, I feel bad for Florida state. And from a Northern perspective, do you think any comparisons that people are making between what Ohio State did with a third-string quarterback in 2014 and where Florida State is now should have been considered are apt comparisons? No, not not really, because Ohio State was thoroughly dominant in its conference championship. They they destroyed Wisconsin. It was was a I can't even remember the final 59 score. Fifty nine nothing. Fifty nine nothing. Yeah, it was it was a total thrashing of what people thought at the time was a good. Wisconsin team that had like a Heisman Trophy candidate on its roster, and Ohio State just destroyed them. This 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 was not that. I, well, at least I I don't think it was that. I I guess I would listen to the argument that like it was that it was just on the other side of the ball. It wasn't Ohio State's offense. Yeah. It was Ohio State's offense that did it to Wisconsin's defense, and this time it was Florida State's defense that did it to Louisville's offense. I get that, but but Ohio State, you know, they shut them out too. Like and and they were looked like a functional football team on both sides of the ball. And I even think you could convince yourself that Ohio State's offense somehow looked better with Cardell Jones a quarterback than it did leading into leading into that game with JT Barrett a quarterback. And certainly Florida State did not have that um, argument with Brock Glenn as its quarterback, nor did it have it with Tate Rodemaker with the way he played against Florida. So um, I, I never thought that that comparison as an argument held, held much water, but even still doesn't change the fact that I believe Florida State still should have got in. So I want to bring up something here from the two Northern conferences as we dive into this uh, more that I think uh, did work out 
in their favor. So it is the idea of that both the Big Ten and the Pac-12 in the end put forth a clear undefeated champ because the one thing the committee will do is if there's confusion, if you have confusion within your conference, they'll just leave you out. They're mm. like, hey, you didn't decide this on your own in a in a in a specific like in a, enough of a forceful way. So you're dumping it on us. So the answer is none. And that's going back to Baylor TCU in 2014 when there was not a Big 12 title game. So argument A is if Oregon had beaten Washington and everything else had gone the same, I think it's possible the Pac-12 champ would have been left out of this because now you're saying, well, they split. Yes, Oregon is a one-loss champ, but you have Texas's win over Alabama. You have Alabama's win over Georgia, Florida State, and Michigan are undefeated. And yeah, Oregon won the title, but they split in their games. So I think Washington winning was emphatic, right? They're undefeated yep. to the Pac-12 champ. But do you think in that scenario, it's not that Oregon's in it, that it's that nobody's in for the Pac-12? Could that have happened? Um, Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it could have. I, I don't know that I... I don't think I'd predict that it, that it would have. I think the Pac-12 champion probably still would have found its way in oh, because like that, that I wonder how much it matters that the, like the Oregon Washington game, like just felt like a heavyweight fight, right? Like it's not, not every conference championship game did. Um, and the stakes were different in the Pac-12 title game. But I, I think, I think you could watch the Pac-12 title game and say to yourself, like these two teams look like teams that should be in the playoff. Now the resume will determine who actually gets into the two of them. But um so I don't know. I, th I think the Pac-12 still would have had a decent decent chance of, of landing a team in this field if that happened. And so then the other argument is that Big Ten, unlike the Pac-12, unlike the ACC, stayed with divisions this year. Both the Big Ten and the SEC did. And the result is that Michigan plays Iowa in the Big Ten championship game. If the Big Ten had done what the ACC or the Pac-12 did, we would have had an Ohio State-Michigan rematch in a Big Ten title game. Mm -hmm. And I definitely had some people saying like, hey, the Big Ten did it to itself. They got this crappy... Big 10 title game as a result when they could have had a, a Michigan Ohio state rematch. If, if they had gone to no divisions and Ohio state had beaten Michigan, could the big 10 have been left out under the same theory of you've now split? Yes. Ohio state's the, the big 10 champ, but they just lost to this same team. It's the same Washington, Oregon argument I was making before. No, I, I don't think so. I guess, I guess if, if both of those things happened, then I and then I can see one of those teams getting left out, right? But if if I'm to uh, theorize in a vacuum for each one, no, I, I don't think either one of them would have been left out. I, I do think it took extraordinary circumstances for Florida State to be left out, though. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's in the committee's DNA to want to leave out a Power Five undefeated champ. So I think the specificity of what happened, which is there's two other healthy undefeated champs, and then there's two one-loss champs one of whom has a win over the other, and the other of whom is the SEC, which is the best conference. I think it's only the specificity of that exact circumstance that led Florida State to being left out. And if there was any other wiggle room, Florida State versus almost any other version of a one-loss champ, I think Florida State would have gotten the edge in those situations. So that's what I'm presenting, yeah. that Florida State versus a one-loss Pac-12 champ in that scenario versus a one-loss Big Ten champ in that scenario. I just think they they went up – they wound up going up against the SEC absorption. The playoff is a lot about absorption. You are who you are, and then you absorb who you beat. So there's no bigger are who you are in the playoff or in college football than the SEC champ. And there's no bigger absorption than beating the SEC champ. Yeah. And those two things both happened. And I think that's the only circumstance that could have kept an undefeated power five champ out, regardless of how hurt they are. So that's why I'm theorizing. I think for the North, you know, um, it would have been, maybe it would have been fun to see Michigan, Ohio state again. I think you would have risked, right. Would have been like Oregon was really yeah. good. I think you would have opened a door. You would have risked like, holy moly, both those teams look really good, but we're stuck. So we're leaving both out. That's my only point. I, I agree with the assumption of risk. I think, I think that's right. Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think Florida state in this hypothetical situation would have won an argument against 
a one loss big champ Ohio State that erased its loss by beating Michigan in the Big Ten championship. I think that that feels almost cut and dry to me. Like I don't think that would have happened. I could see it happening if it were Michigan and I think either Pac twelve team, but I still I still don't I'm not hundred percent certain Florida State would have won those arguments. All right, so now history of the uh, 14 playoff, which has now come to an end. Bama makes it eight times in 10 years. Clemson, six. Ohio State, five. Oklahoma, four. Georgia and Michigan, three each. Washington and Notre Dame, two each. And then one appearance for Cincinnati, Michigan State, Florida State, TCU, Oregon, LSU, and Texas. After seven years... We had four teams who had taken 22 of the 28 spots. Bama, Clemson, Oklahoma, and Ohio State had accounted for 79% of the playoff appearances. And now, the last three years, we got Michigan. That Michigan just took Ohio State spot. We got Michigan three times, Georgia twice, Bama as one of those old, old guard. They mm-hmm. get in twice, but Cincinnati once, TCU once, Ohio State got in once, Washington once, Texas once. Like it, we did get. Right when people were getting like desperately stale in terms of the playoff, we got new blood. So, I mean, you look at this. This is pretty good to have Washington, Texas. Michigan's not new anymore. But, you know, we had those four teams. We had a year where I think those four teams made it. It's like Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma. It's the same fan bases. This is this is a nice kind of a new swirl of playoff teams. Yeah, it's and even like Michigan, I don't think. I don't think nationally there's like fatigue with seeing Michigan in the field again, the same way there was with those four teams that you mentioned and the new, the new blood's great. Um, I do kind of wish maybe they weren't playing each other so that you could get that in the national championship. Like you're almost guaranteed it, but uh, I think it was right probably to have at least Texas third. I think maybe, maybe we can talk about whether or not Washington should have been first. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's good to get newish blood there. Um, and it, even you get the root for, you know, underdog Alabama, little scrappy old oh, number four Alabama. Yeah. So I want to talk about we're going to talk briefly about the two games because we're going to do major breakdowns. And as we sit here, we have not locked it in officially, but we also are planning to be there. So yes. we will tell anybody who watches Kings of the North and we appreciate everybody who's listening on a podcast or watching live our YouTube or catching this later on YouTube that our plan at the moment is to have one of us at one of these semifinals and one at another because we do have North versus South in two semifinals. And Landis, I looked at the history of the semifinals, so this will now be 20 semifinals, right? Do you want to guess how many of those 20 semifinals? We got Michigan, Alabama. Washington, Texas. How many of the 20 were North versus South of the semifinals? 14. 15. 15. Good guess. 15, counting these two, five were South versus South. Mm -hmm. The only North versus North game in the history of the college football playoff is the first national championship game because Ohio State beat Alabama and Oregon beat Florida State, and there is an opportunity here for us to go out the same way we came in, which is a North versus North national championship. The first one was in Dallas. This one would be in Houston. So, Uh like, it's out there for the Huskies Uh and the Wolverines because if Georgia had won, we would have gotten a Southern semifinal, Georgia versus Texas in the Sugar Bowl, Super Southern, and we would have gotten a super traditional Northern Rose Bowl, Michigan versus Washington, Big Ten, Pac-12, historic, the end of the Pac-12. There's there's kind of a an elegance that if that if Georgia had won and that would have happened, there that would have been there would have been a little beauty in that, but instead we're going head to head north versus south. But which would you have rather had? See, so, so like I uh... I don't know. It's interesting. Like a year ago when we weren't doing this show, maybe I would have preferred the the traditional matchups there, get a Southern Sugar Bowl and, an, and, a, and a Northern Rose Bowl and traditional Rose Bowl. But now I like that we could get two teams that we talk about yeah. a lot on the show in the national championship. So I think that's my preference. Do you know? So the 13 semifinals that have been North versus South so far, do you know what the record is in the, in the 13 games? Uh, 12 and one for the South. 10 and three. So Ohio State has wins over Alabama and Clemson and oh, right. Oregon and there's the Oregon win over Florida State. Those yeah, are the yeah, three. Yeah. So so the North has a little bit of a hill to climb. Um but before we talk about that, can we talk about SEC bias? Anybody on Kings of the North want to talk about SEC bias? <laughs> Let's do it. You you're up for it? 
Yeah. Can we get the balloons? <laughs> SEC bias. Did I, can I make the balloons come up again? Oh, um, cool. So let's talk about was there SEC bias in the committee? Because this is something that our good buddy Joel Klatt has brought up in the past. Um, and the idea that there at times the committee has leaned a little south with the backgrounds of the people involved. Looking at the 13 people who are on the committee this year, I had five whose background. And so it's sit, there's a sitting AD from all the Power Five conferences and then a couple other sitting ADs. It's by definition. I had five people who kind of leaned north, four who leaned south, and then um, like four who kind of should have had no lean, I think. So I think in the end, at times, it's felt like some of the other random people, but like there's Rod West is on it. He's a, a trustee at Notre Dame. Will Shields is on it. He's a former Nebraska player, right? Some of the like random people who aren't sitting ADs who are just like, chosen experts they do have a bit of a northern background so I, I think it's worth being on alert for that but i don't think this was like jim grobes on there former wake forest coach baylor coach i count him as a south guy but i don't think it was a bunch of southern good old boys sitting around yeah to like make sure the sec got in no I, yeah i think that's that's probably the balance you want right like kind of half and half regionally and then sprinkle in the rest who shouldn't have a, a dog in the fight and yeah. maybe they, they bring balance to it. Yeah. So the Kansas state AD is in there. I called him like neutral. Chris Alt, former Nevada coach is in there. I called him neutral. Cl mm -hmm. uh, Chet Gladchuk, the Navy AD, ah, it's the Navy. They protect everybody. Right. I mean like the Navy, That's they great. don't, they don't only, that'd be bad. Yeah. The Navy was like, we're sending all the boats to the South. <laughs> <laughs> Some like North Korea wants to attack the North to heck with them. Like that would, they wouldn't do that. They're the Navy. We no, they the would Navy. never do that. No, no, go Navy. And then, uh, and then there's a media person in the media. Come on. And the media person used to work at USA today. That's literally. Who the is whole it? Country. Kelly Whiteside. Okay. Literally the whole country someday, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can't put you on. Cause you'll just be what? screaming, screw the sec. No, 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 no. I just have a point of view at the moment. You know, it's just, I'm, yeah. I'm still, okay. I'm very, I'm very fair. <laughs> I refuse. I'd have like a split person. Like I'd be like 20% of my arguments in the room. Be like, oh my God, Doug's. <laughs> How dare? Because that would it be. I'd be like 80% north, but then my 20% south. Stetson Bennett, college football lawyer, would come out and then he would shout. So he'd make up for it. So let's talk about the ESPN dog mentality show that absolutely insulted us insulted us by acting like Georgia was part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. They open, they say Washington and Michigan are in, and then there are 14. There's a thumb. I just got a thumb in a bubble. Do you see my thumb in a bubble? Cause I, put I my do thumb see up. it. Yeah. This is great. This, we, we got motion graphics now. Who knew? Yeah. Yeah. Are we paying extra for that? <laughs> so they say four teams for two spots. And they say Alabama, Texas, Florida State, and Georgia. And then they have correspondence at places, and they have a correspondent in Athens, Georgia. And then they're like, let's reveal number six to find out who's who's not going to make it first. And, of course, it's Georgia. Why are they pretending? Why, why was that shoved down our gullets that we had? Who is it for? Did Stetson Bennett, college football lawyer, just like make like threaten to sue ESPN if they didn't falsely include Georgia in that discussion. It was a joke, man. They had no shot to get in. And ESPN, which is starting its SEC television package next year, mm -hmm. it was an abomination to include Georgia in that discussion. Do you well, well there are two time defending national champs. Is it not worth being there just to see their reaction for not getting in? I agree with you that the tenor of the conversation like presented it like they actually had a chance to get in, and of course they had no chance of getting in. But I do think it's worthwhile to be on location with the two time defending national champs as they get left out of the playoff. Let me rewind. Did they show it? Did they show sad dog mentality? Dog mentality. Oh, I don't know. Did they not? Yeah, I guess they I didn't. don't think so. Yeah. I hey, Kirby. Hey, Kirby. We're going to send somebody down to just make sure we have cameras on how sad you are. Oh, you know what? You know what? They weren't sad. You know why? Because they knew they weren't in. Yeah. And they were. They were like when they threw. And I, I'm not. I can't remember who it was. When they threw the ESPN reporter, like the the gist of the report was 
just parroting Kirby Smart's talking points about why Georgia deserved to be in, which is a joke. I agree with that. I, I, it's it, it undermines ESPN's credibility. Absolutely mm-hmm. undermines their credibility when you have a graphic. I was making fun of the athletic on Saturday night for having a graphic that was like, who's going to make it? And they had George in the graphic. That was not this discussion. We've only had two non-champs from a Power 5 conference ever make it, right? It's not the norm. And in a world where the five conference champs were very deserving, it was not a discussion point. No. So I hate false discussion. Whether it is a host saying something he or she doesn't believe in the name of just like creating a talking point, or whether it's a network that is beholden to a future TV contract to puff up a conference, doing so and acting like it's news. Puff them up on your own time. Don't puff them up on what should be the news show that's the reveal, when, by the way, every analyst, other than Booger, every other analyst is like, hey, it's got to be the SEC. The SEC is great. It's got to be the SEC. Uh, Obviously, the SEC had an argument. They had a great argument. Sure. And they got in. But it was not a slam dunk, and it certainly, most of all, was not a discussion about should two SEC teams get in. Like, I understand. This is this muddies the waters on when are you a news organization and when are you a partner, right? When are you promoting and when are you reporting? And they often want to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, this is an analysis reporting show. We're revealing news. We paid for the right to reveal the news here. We're going to have a discussion among analysts that they hope that we should respect for their knowledge and insight. And then they lie to us. And they, they put in puff promotion in a new show. And sometimes I think people are overboard with like ESPN and SEC bias and stuff. Cause sometimes like, listen, man, they're good. I don't tell you. I thought this was as, as, as an, as egregious an example as I've seen from ESPN. And when they're going to be the network of the SEC starting next year, it really raises my hackles, brother. Do we, so, so the playoff is not going to be solely an ESPN property moving. Like when we expand, right? Well, that's part of the, that's like part of why the Alliance stepped in and was like, Hey, like we got to make sure we right. bid this out. So the ES- ESPN gets the playoff the next two years. Cause it's still part of the original 12 year TV deal, but then they're going to throw it open. So do we need to do then like, cause I agree. I agree with you. I've heard everything you said about ESPN and, and the SEC bias that is only going to become worse now. Like, do we need to simulcast these, these rankings? Do we need to like have, I don't know, be, feel free to do it here on the Kings of the North yeah. YouTube channel. Play a college football playoff committee if you want to, and we'll throw to uh, you know someone standing in Ohio State's trophy lobby and someone up up in uh, Eugene, Oregon, but they don't have a shot to get in either. Uh, just to make sure we're balancing it yeah. out. Like this, does Fox need to do that now to, about to balance it out? If that's the world we're going to be living in, yeah. I mean, because that's and that's why again, this is like this is this is an example. So in the world where the SEC is complaining that it's not twelve right now, this is why. This is why everybody tried to take a pause to say we don't want the SEC and ESPN to control the world together because when they do it looks like this it looks like a lie so that's why we don't have 12 right now okay so it's not yeah. it's it, it you did it to yourself and i do think in the end people make fun of the alliance i absolutely understood you've got to gather the troops so in the end the alliance ate each other but The real like people people only make fun of the alliance. The the actual thing of the alliance in the end is that the Big Ten, which obviously was like first among equals in that group, wound up in a stronger position than it was previously. And I think I would argue that almost all of the teams in the Pac-12 wound up in a good, strong position with where they landed in the Big Ten and the Big 12, Big now 12. N- not Oregon State and Washington State, which got scrawled, and not Cal and uh, Stanford, who wound up in the ACC. That's all kind of screwed up. But like right. eight of the 12 wound up in good spots. And like the SEC, uh, excuse me, the ACC is still trying to figure it out. So the ACC, as part of the alliance, did get screwed here, which is why I would rather screw the SEC than screw the ACC. But like I understood, I think the alliance in some ways did work. Because they built a firewall, Mm -hmm. they took, it was their last chance. If you don't build a wall, then it's over. 
It's just the SEC ESPN version of college football from then on. And it's not. That's why we exist. That's why this show exists. Because there actually is a northern version, a non-ESPN version of college football that has power. So that worked. And if this was the fallout, unfortunately, Florida State gets bit yeah. by the fallout when I wish it would have been either Texas or, SC, or the SEC that got bit. Who who do you think it should have been? What what were you, what, what what would your four have been? It's very hard to leave out an SEC champ. I understand that. My overriding philosophy is there was no right answer. I think it's very difficult, based only on the football, to make a super compelling argument that's like you're right. Because mm -hmm. like it's not like Florida State didn't have good wins. That's LSU wins a good win. It's not like they had a lousy non-conference like Michigan did or something. Like they actually went out and played some people. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I actually would have left out the SEC in the end because yeah. it happened to everybody else. It happened to them. Like, very sorry, but I think like the transit of property, I still wind up going. I head to head still matters to me. And I don't think you can, I don't think it's fair to assume that a team's gonna be bad. And Based a little bit on the defense, good defense can be just as impressive as good offense. I think that's part of the argument. And it's not like Bama has been a perfect team the whole way either. Like if we're going to ding Florida State for not looking great at the end of the year, Bama won its last regular season game on a freaking miracle. Right. So like we're digging people for not looking good enough late in the year. Right. I mean, I, I think there's actual like football arguments against it. And I, I actually would have. And then, all other things being equal, I legitimately think you started this. It's your fault, SEC. So that's a 1% factor that might have pushed me one way or the other. I actually, in the end, in the committee room, would have voted to leave out Alabama, and I believe I could have presented at least a defensible argument to that reason. Difficult, but defensible. And I know I'm not the only person who thinks that way. I know Nicole are back at the athletic and I saw like tweeted that I saw some other people saying it. I do. Cause I've always strongly voted in the AP poll. And it's like, if we're not going by results on the field, like what are we doing? What and doing? Florida, yeah. Florida state did everything they could. And it wasn't against a horrible, it's not a G five schedule. It's a real schedule. <clears throat> I just don't know like why. Cause uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. My, my four would have been the three, we the three, we have in the top three in Florida state. And I understand that Florida State now is not the Florida State to beat LSU and is not the Florida State that a lot of people, including yourself, had pegged as a national championship winner prior to this season. But I don't I don't quite understand and can't wrap my mind around why finding a way to beat a good team on a neutral field with your third string quarterback is viewed as anything other than a sign of the strength of your team. Like I, I don't I don't understand that. And yes, it was ugly. Like, I, I don't care that it was ugly. Teams play ugly games. Like you said, Alabama played ugly games. Texas played ugly games. Michigan has not played its best football over the last month. Washington certainly played ugly games in the middle of the season after, after it played Oregon the first time. Doesn't feel like any of those teams are getting penalized for that. Right. So I don't know why Florida State would be, even though it, and, 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 and it's vastly different because they had to do it with their third string quarterback and still found a way to win. That's that's the right. biggest holdoff for me. So I, I think Florida State should have been in. Yeah. And that they played Saturday night with a third string quarterback, and by the playoff, they would have been playing a second string quarterback who would have had a month to prep. Right. I think is like the, the idea of like, okay, well, they weren't going to be the Jordan Travis Florida State, but they also weren't going to be the Florida State we saw the last two weeks. That's exactly right. Yep. So I think I think that is a very compelling argument. Let's talk about the games that are happening. We're gonna have future more in-depth breakdowns on both these semifinals on Kings of the North. We invite you to come back on Monday. Monday, where we will discuss what a 12-team playoff would have looked like this year, what that would have meant for the North, and what it tells us about what we think the 12-team playoff should look like in future years, how many Northern teams should be getting in every year. So it's not just going to be like, oh, hey, it would have been, uh, you know, Oregon, Ohio State in round one. It's going to be beyond that. It's going to be like what, what this is could have told us about what actually is going to happen starting next year. But I want you to guess the early lines are out. What do you think the line is on Alabama, Michigan? Uh, Michigan minus two and a half. Oh my God. Let's do a betting show. <laughs> Michigan minus two. Okay. So good. What do you think the line is on Washington, Texas? 
Washington minus three. Wrong. Badly. Okay. This okay. shocks me. Texas minus four and a half. I think people are underestimating Ooh. Washington. That is, yeah. I, I don't we see pa- that Can we all. pause? I got I to gotta, I gotta go make a wager. So the other, the other thing is, um, and I know people have made this point, Washington winds up in the Sugar Bowl. And I think regardless of seeding, like if for Washington to have somehow gotten to the Rose Bowl would have been quite an edge for mm-hmm. for Washington. But I also think like that Michigan gets Bama not in New Orleans and that obviously Michigan is the one seed. Michigan's going to pick the Rose Bowl. You don't want to play a Southern team in the South. And also, the, you know, the Rose Bowl has been the home of the, of the Big Ten. It's like if Washington somehow would have gotten past Michigan for the one seed. So this is a tough spot for Washington and Texas to play in the Sugar Bowl because that's going to be a bunch of Texas people driving over to their new SEC home. Um, yeah. Do you think Washington should have been the one seed over Michigan? Was there an argument there? I do think Washington should have been the one seed over Michigan. I think Washington's resume is better. Um, it, it, I guess it doesn't help Washington that like its best win is beating the same team twice. Like I that that logic doesn't make sense to me, but I guess I could see why it might have been used in the, in the committee room. Or I guess I wouldn't be surprised if it was used in the committee room. I certainly don't agree with it. Um, but but by and large, I think the Pac-12 was a much better conference than the Big Ten. And Washington won that conference while putting together a better resume than Michigan did. And Washington, it turns out, you know, played the Mountain West champion in the non-conference, and Michigan's non-conference was a joke. So um, I think Washington had a strong case to be number one and should have been number one and should have been able to get the preference of playing in the Rose Bowl. Washington Washington beat the Mountain West champ because Washington beat Boise State, right? Yeah. But Michigan did beat UNLV, who was the team that lost the Mountain West championship. That's actually That's Michigan's right. best non-conference win. That's the best non-conference win. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I do think I, I do think that's a little bit of a tough draw for Washington. The idea this and people have brought this up, where we were with Michigan two and a half weeks ago, and where we are with Michigan now as the undefeated number one seed in the playoff, Jim Harbaugh is back. Like they haven't looked, they certainly didn't look great offensively on Saturday night, but also it's it's one of these things. I, I don't know. We have to be able to do a show, and I do think like the Pac-12, Washington and Oregon coming to the Big Ten is going to be part of this discussion. We're going to see what the Washington and Oregon offenses look like in the Big Ten next year. You just don't get credit for defense. You just don't get credit for defense. And so like what what, what Michigan faced with the Ohio State and Iowa defenses the last two weeks compared to like what Texas faced or what even Washington and Oregon faced in each other defensively. You and I did talk about, we did think the Oregon defense was pretty good. Listen, Iowa plays really good defense though. So I don't only chalk that up. Like, I don't know about Michigan's offense. You know, I I do want to give credit to the Ohio state and Iowa defenses there, but the bottom line is like Michigan has risen like Michigan. Mm -hmm. What a spot for Michigan to be in. Do you feel like the Connor stallion situation either permanently or momentarily is wiped away um momentarily right it's it's going to come roaring back whenever the NCAA decides it, it wants to to make that happen but i i i think in the build up to this game and as the game is happening i think that is momentarily on the back burner because whether you agree with it or not like michigan you know i don't want to say put it behind it but like that that has stopped assuming like presumably has stopped and then they played their most difficult games on their schedule, and they won all of them. So, like, I, I think that doing that helps helps put them on the back burner a little bit. So, I mean, I do. I, you do have to give them credit. Like, once this stuff, you know, the 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 Connor Stallions is off the sideline, and they were penalized for that. Like, again, they've won um, some good games, right? So, like, you have to give credit, I think, to Michigan for 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 the on field performance. And I do think Michigan. There is like Michigan is very good at football and I do find it this. Let's talk briefly about these two matchups now before we get out of here. Did we rant enough? Did I yell enough about uh, the SEC in Georgia? I think we're good. Yeah. 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 We want to make sure that people understand that Kings of the North is a show that bro- both contextualizes and celebrates Northern football, but also tells the South to cram it. And sometimes right. I worry that we don't tell the South to cram it enough. Do you think we did today? 
I think we we scratched that itch today. Yeah, I think okay. we're good. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Michigan, Alabama. The last time Michigan and Alabama played, what I think happened is like a definitive, like definitive proof that Michigan like wasn't on Alabama's level, and now they are favored over Alabama um, in a playoff game. And so to think of of like how far Michigan has come as a program. They did meet in the Citrus Bowl after the 2019 season, and Alabama won that game 35 to 16, 16, excuse me. But the game that I really remember was the pre, like early season neutral site games that Alabama used to play all the time. And they played in Jerry World in, in Arlington, Texas to open the 2012 season. And Alabama beat Michigan 41 to 14. And that's a decade ago. And the, the coming out of there is like, okay, like that is, and, and that was b- before Harbaugh. That was sort of Michigan of like trying desperately to figure it out and not being able to do it. But what the Michigan, how far the Michigan program has come in the last decade. I think is going to be on display in this version of a game where I think it's kind of a toss up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. It'll be like, it would have been a little poetic, right? If I had Michigan drawn Georgia somehow in this matchup after Michigan kind of like pivoted to having beat Georgia periods in practice and was looking to get back to this spot to play an sec team. And I think kind of, kind of prove it's worth in the way you're talking about most of that. If not, I mean, all um, everything other than the G being on the helmet, I think still stands here in this game for Michigan in terms of narrative. And we'll talk more in depth about it. I don't, I don't know how I feel about Michigan's positioning here in terms of it being, having a stronger chance of, of doing that. And part of it this too is like this being a lesser Alabama team. But as I was, if I, as I've watched Michigan, like with a closer eye the last few weeks, um, I'm not particularly impressed with their offensive line, and I, you know, I'm incredibly impressed with Alabama's defensive line. So, like that, that is like a reading where my mind went when I saw this matchup come out, and we'll talk about it more in depth. But I don't, I think I agree with Michigan being favored. I don't know that I look at this as a particularly favorable matchup for Michigan. Well, and it's, it's going to become they're really going to miss Zach Zinter, right? So, yes. I mean, the idea of Michigan's offensive yeah. line now without its best member of the offensive line an all American quality guard who's out for the year after breaking his leg against Ohio state like that could really come home to roost. Now, again, they, they felt like they had seven dudes coming into the year on the offensive line. So they still are playing dudes. Like they aren't going to, uh, you know, a red shirt freshman who played 14 snaps this year, right? They're Mm -hmm. moving guys around, move Barnhart inside Trente Jones. Like they, they have enough guys. They are probably more able to make up, for it with their top level depth than a lot of teams would be, but Zach Zinter is awesome. And yeah. you can't, you can't completely make up for him. No, you can't. And like, but there's, you know, there's, there's plenty to like about that team too. And like seeing JJ McCarthy in that spot's going to be fascinating. I do believe in Michigan's defense. I think there's a lot of difference makers on that side of the ball, you know, having to figure out how to contain Jalen Miller will be, will be a, a fun thing to, to diagnose here, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting draw for Michigan. And then when we think about the uh, Texas-Washington game, Texas's one loss was 34-30 to to Oklahoma. That Oklahoma offense, I think, is, you know, the offense that sort of most um, put Texas back on its heels. We know how good the Texas defense has been. But I certainly think stylistically, and what we've talked about all year with Washington on Kings of the North, the relentless sort of assault that they are able to put forth. And you saw, we talked about it. The return of Jalen McMillan, of healthy Jalen McMillan, they got back to being maximum Washington in the passing game against Oregon because Jalen McMillan and Romo Dunze both had over 100 yards. Jalen Polk was still part of that. Dylan Johnson got going in the run game. And I do think like a lot of the struggles that we saw from Washington coincided with Jalen McMillan not being on the field. And he's back. And I think Texas is going to have trouble with that. And again, the Washington defense, I think, is a little opportunistic. They have a couple dudes. I don't think down after down, success rate, that kind of thing, they're as good as some of the other top defenses in the country. But I don't think they're going to get steamrolled. And I'm not sure exactly when we arrived at the point that Texas is a juggernaut, at that Quinn Ewers is a perfect quarterback. And I don't, I don't want to dismiss Texas, but Oklahoma State was kind of incompetent 
in the Big 12 title game. And I knew that I know that Quinn Ewers threw for 300 yards in just the first half. But Washington's defense is going to be significantly better than that. And Oklahoma State was playing a sixth or seventh year four time transfer quarterback, Alan Bowman, who just who's a mistake machine, former like fourth stringer at Michigan. Mm -hmm. And Washington has Michael Penix. So, yep. like the idea that, like, oh, ho, 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 here comes Texas, I don't get because I still think that like Oregon's better than Texas. Right. I mean, I don't like, I, I think Oregon is a better, yeah. like it's or similar, similar. Yeah. Yeah. And Washington took care of business twice. Like, and Kalen DeBoer is a great coach and Penix. And when they have all their guys at receiver, I like this matchup for Washington. The toughest part is that it's not in Pasadena, but they're also not playing Georgia or Bama or LSU in New Orleans. They're playing Texas who is now you know, there's going to be a lot of SEC chants, but they weren't, won't be quite as vocal. There's going to be a lot of LSU and Ole Miss and Georgia and Alabama fans being like, right, are we, we're rooting for these guys? Yeah, yeah. I, guess. I hope, uh, I, I really hope that Washington gets a good crowd there because it is, I think it is going to feel like a road game for the most part. Um, it's funny, it's funny that this is how it worked out because as I was thinking on Saturday night about potential matchups, the two kind of things that I settled on as being like the most intriguing and potentially problematic were, Michigan handling a pass rush like Alabama's and Texas's defense handling a passing attack like Washington's because Texas's pass defense is actually quite bad. Um, and I think that Washington is going to have a lot of opportunities in this game to like be who they are. Um, and it was really good to see Washington like kind of get everybody back. Like Penix only ended up throwing one touchdown um, and it was to a tight end. But to see to see the receivers kind of do what we expect them to do and have Dylan Johnson run the ball the way that he ran. Like if, if I'm a team playing tech Washington in the playoff, like that was a little terrifying to me. And, and I think there's like, there's time for Washington to get healthy here. And obviously that's true for everybody, but that might help Washington the most of anyone in the field. When you think like, I think Michael Penix has been dinged up for a while. Like, can he get right? Um, certainly more time for the, for the receivers to get even more healthy. Maybe there's some guys on defense for Washington who can get a little healthier too, particularly on the back end. Um, so I like the matchup too. I like, I like this matchup for Washington against Texas far more than I like Michigan's matchup against Alabama. Okay. So listen, we will see you guys on Monday, not live, but Monday for our regular Kings of the North, where again, we're going to talk about the future of the 12 team playoff in terms of the North. And then what we will do in December on this channel is we will break down both semifinals in depth. We will dive in hard. We will do one show on Alabama, Michigan. We will do a separate show on Washington, Texas. We hope we'll bring in some outside experts. We hope for those discussions and Bill and I will crunch a bunch of tape and look at some numbers and really dive in on what we think is going to happen in those games. And then again, we just, we want you guys to understand that this is a place to come talk about national college football from a Northern perspective, because as we saw, Sometimes, too often, what people pretend is the national perspective is southern tinged. Balloons are back. They, Balloons love, are back. When I, they love when I rip this out. Yeah. Is southern tinged. And so we, we admit it. We tinge it north because somebody's got to. So we're going to have a lot of discussion here on Kings of the North. And then our plan is to be live reporting, interviewing, talking to people live on site, both in Los Angeles for the Rose Bowl and in New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. And that Landis and I, we think we're going to be split up. We'll be in opposite places and then coming here to bring you even more Kings of the North. So if you're listening to this on a podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Kings of the North YouTube channel, so you don't miss anything. If you're watching this live, if you've come across it, if you're watching it on replay on the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel because we're going to be doing even more shows in the month of December. When we, when we get to the sites, we're going to be going every day. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about these huge national games from the perspective of Northern football. So for now, thanks to everybody that has joined us. Thanks to our producer, Mike Rostowski, for helping us set this up. Landis, anything we did not rant? We covered it. We good? Anything else you want to rant about on the way out? No, we covered it. Uh, okay. The South can cram it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, thanks again to everybody for being part of this new venture. Kings of the North kind of worked out, man. Again, like we've, this is the, the 15th of the 20 semifinals, 14 and 15 of the 20 in this 10 year era 
is going to be North versus South. So we're used to North versus South, but a lot of those North versus South are like Clemson kicking Notre Dame's butt or Alabama destroying Michigan state or whatever. Right. Like, I mean, this is, these are competitive and actually the yeah. Northern teams are the higher seats. So like, yeah, this is real. It got real. You, I, I want your, your answer to this. Cause you asked me earlier in the show preference North versus North or North versus South in each playoff. What's your preference? You like, are I you mean, happy with where we are? Yeah. I, I, I think I'm, I think I'm happy with where we are because I do think it's two competitive games and they're different kind of interesting games. And we just would have lathered ourselves in the history of the PAC 12 and the big 10 at the Rose bowl and been like a oh, goodbye to the Rose bowl. But actually like, I'm okay with like goodbye to the Rose bowl. I would rather have like two like North South bangers probably. So I, I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm sad. I think that we maybe instead of being at the same place and getting to go to, uh, you know, in and out together in Pasadena, <laughs> I'll have to go by myself while you're eating beignets in new Orleans but I think for the show it'll be okay. Yeah, I think for the I think for the show it'll be better. I'm really excited about what we're going to be able to do out there um, with our reporting and, and hopefully grabbing some interviews with some entertaining people as well. So it should be fun. Yeah, and nobody else is doing this. So yeah. like, if if tell a friend if you've stumbled across us, tell a friend. Hey, yeah, yeah, like kind of a national perspective, but with from a northern view. That's what we're doing here on Kings of the. All right, thanks to everybody for joining us here for this live show for Bill Landis. I'm Doug Maurice. and that was the college football playoff reaction on Kings of the North.